All right, the moment you've all been waiting for. Mr. James Everett has been uh, generous with his time and uh, tech and, skills and tech skills and his his creative thinking in adjusting our process. So a hat tip hat tip to him uh, for for bearing with us during interesting times as well. Let me tell you a little bit about James. James grew up in Colorado, where he graduated in the bottom three of his high school class. Following high school, James enlisted in the Air Force, later became a sergeant at the Colorado Department of Corrections, and eventually landed at the Denver Public Library, where he has spent the last 10 years learning and growing. From security clerk, to technology specialist, to now the learning program specialist. James and I were talking a little bit earlier, we have a lot in common with respect to leadership development and propelling our fellow human beings, so I'm excited to hear from him. He, he's, uh, he's spent his life discovering who he is and how he can best serve and, and propel others. So such a, a great topic for the times. James is convinced that there has to be more to just going to work, doing a task and getting paid to do it <clears throat> and regularly ask the question, how can we use our positions in life and in our jobs to really uncover and discover the core of who we really are, our identity? Please welcome to the stage, to the room, to the digital platform, James Everett. Hello, everyone. So let's, let's see here. All right. So I want to first start off by saying uh, I wish I could be here uh, or have you here with me, um, but due to the circumstances, uh, that was not possible. But um, even with that, I think. Uh, just realizing and understanding that you're logged on, we're still communicating, we're still talking. The technology is here for us to be able to do that. So um, with that, um, today we're alive and we're here. And so with that, we have an opportunity to figure out and discover our true identity. And so we're going to be talking about identity today. So if you see the first slide here, you're going to see Uncle Chan. Uncle Chan is 82 years old. And two years ago, um, I bought a house in Denver, which was pretty crazy. It was a crazy <laughs> circumstance, but I'm sure I can share that story at another time. Um, but Uncle Chan right here, he's a locksmith. And so for our housewarming gift, he made us keys. He rekeyed our locks, and it was so sweet and so amazing. And so, like I've said, he's 82 years old now. And he's just an amazing man, amazing guy that I just love. And so <coughs> whenever I get a chance, I just stay around him just to listen, just listen to his stories, all the, the, um, the jokes that he has, all the, the things he has for me to, uh, to just process and to learn and grow from him. And so a couple of weeks ago, he called me and asked me if uh, we could meet for lunch. And so I was like, oh, okay. So I've known Uncle Chan forever. He's never asked me to lunch. So I was like, oh, he has something to tell me. And so, sure, I was like, yeah, let's go and do it. And so when I went with him, we sat down and we started eating and it was going well. And then Uncle Chan, um, and he's a nice guy, let me throw that out there, he's a nice guy. Um, but he threw out there, he's like, James, I need to really talk to you. I'm like, sure. Um, and Uncle Chan says, hey, um, when you teach and uh, when, you, when you're sharing information, it's hard for me to hear you. And I was like, well, why is that? And I'm gonna say this, distilled to the, to the, to the, uh, the uh, common denominator or the lowest level. Um, he, he said that because you're a liar. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, okay, I'm a liar. Um, okay, and so right then I, could, I felt um, the desire to become defensive. But I was like, you know what? I'm gonna actually walk through this. And so I was like, okay, tell me more. And so Uncle Chan, he was explaining to me how um, three, on three different occasions, I was supposed to meet with them, but I had told them, which was not a lie. It was not a lie. My wife was not feeling well. I have to take her home. I have to, um, you know, I have to take care of her. And so that was the truth. But he saw something beyond that. And he went further and said, you really didn't want to meet with me, did you? And I said, no. And he was like, so that is technically a lie. I was like, you got me. You got it. And so this is the whole thing. When we talk about identity, getting to the core of who we are, it's getting rid of all the masks, all the facades and everything. And if someone calls you out, 
you have a choice. Either become defensive, have a reasoning, have an excuse for it, which I do have a, a pretty solid excuse. My wife is sick. But at the core, I really didn't want to be with her. And so as we spoke and as I accepted it and I said, okay, I appreciate it. And if it was just that lesson, totally cool, totally fine. I'm not mad at him. I understand his position. And I understand too that I'm not going to hide behind uh, my wife's sick. So Uncle Chan, he went on to take me to, to visit a man. This man was a biochemist. And this biochemist was laying there in bed. And he was in hospice. Uh, he couldn't say anything. He couldn't do anything. Uh, staff had to take care of him. And so as I'm sitting there with Uncle Chan, Uncle Chan's explaining to me about the death process. And he's like, at this point, they're no longer feeding him. At this point, he can't swallow anymore, so they can't give him anything to drink. He showed me some sponges, and he's like, you know, um, when the nurses come in, they wet the sponge and just put it around his mouth just so he could have some moisture. And so I was taking it all in. I saw this man laying there, and it really impacted me. And so as we got up to leave, we made it to the van, and I sat in the driver's seat with Uncle Chan, I said, Uncle Chan, thank you for teaching me this lesson. Uh, thank you for sharing with me what you saw, looking past what I uh, put up, and really calling me out on that. Um, and I looked at Uncle Chan again, and I was like, when we visited that man, that's reality, right? And he said, yeah, that's reality. And so what was reinforced to me is that I want to be able to show up as my authentic self. If I don't want to go to a meeting, I want to be able to say no. If I don't want to do something, I want to be empowered to say no. I don't want to hide behind excuses. I don't want to hide behind uh, valid reasons on why I'm not doing something. And so that is a difficult task. That goes to the core of, of who I really am, what I'm about. And so let's keep moving forward and talk about it. Oh, yes. Okay, so specifically, we're going to be talking about how you can craft your true identity, your true authentic self at work. Oftentimes, when we think about work, we can just think about, oh, this is another eight hours I have to spend. Oh, I have a new supervisor. Or I got a promotion. I'm the new, super I'm the new supervisor. All these different layers and all these different things we can think about at work. We can even look at what can we create while we're at work. Uh, do we have the time to create the things that we want to create? But along with that, I don't want us to forget that as we're building and as we're creating external things, to not neglect the internal things as well. So this is an overgeneralization, overgeneralization. So I know this is not specific to everyone. So when you look at humans, we always ask the question, who am I? And so if you look at the love piece, you can, under that umbrella of love, we can look at um, nature or versus nature, or nature versus nurture. Or we can look at um, gene expression, right? Did this person get enough attention? Did this person get enough love? I don't know, right? From that, we can look at adaptation from all the input that this person has. How do they express it? How do they get their needs met? What did they do? Are they, did they go to college to, to earn more money? Did they... Uh, uh, what freelance, are they doing consulting work? What is it that they're doing to adapt to whatever input that they receive? But at the core of that, we can forget about we still have a personal identity. And so I'm not asking today of who am I? Because hopefully as we continue to grow, continue to create, pre continue to develop, that's gonna change over time. So as we work towards whatever we're, wherever, to wherever we're going, it's, what am I made of? What are we made of? What are you made of? I don't know. Let's talk about it. So we can talk about a lot of things when it comes to identity, but today's talk specifically about being at work. And so when you ask the questions, people, what is it that you're trying to get out of work? What do you want from work? And a lot of people say, I just want to be happy. I want, I want to be working in an environment that makes me happy. Don Draper said this, and it was perfect. 
What is happiness? It's a moment before you need more happiness. If you decide that, hey, when I come to work, I want to be happy. Well, keep going, get more happy. So, and I don't want to play with words today, but I just want to show you that there's a difference between happiness and joy. So for instance, Creative Mornings, um, I, with Creative Mornings, I was asked to give a speech today, to give a talk today. So I was happy to hear that. So thank you, I'm happy, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to talk to you. But you're not here in front of me right now. Well, virtually, but not the people, which I was really excited to see the people, right? But you're not here. So my happiness turned to sadness. I'm not so happy anymore, right? But the joy in it, the joy in it, now that's different. The joy was Annie Kimberling, who works for the library, asked me to do this talk. She heard me do a 10 minute little, uh, little talk about being you, being the authentic you. And so she asked me to do it. So even if this speech didn't happen today, this talk today, this exchange didn't happen today, I still had joy that Annie thought, hey, maybe somebody want to hear James, right? Maybe um, she thought to herself, someone needs to hear what James is talking about, about um, not seeking after necessarily after happiness, right? But understanding that what we're really seeking is joy. And joy is simply if, let's say for instance, it's a similar thing, I'm just gonna give another picture of this. If I give you a mug, right? You take that mug and it was a, a creative mornings mug. So give you that right there. You took that and it broke. Again, happiness can turn to sadness just like that. But if you look past happiness is, and saw the joy for yourself that, hey, I thought about you and thought you should have this. There's joy with that. So hopefully you see the difference. And I, right now I'll be asking you, hey, tell me, you know, is there a difference? Do you see that, uh, that happiness and joy can be different, right? So joy isn't situational. It's, it's sustainable versus happiness where you're just going to have to run the race of getting more happiness. So I am a person that went on a journey. And so by no means is I'm, am I sitting here telling you that you need to go on the same journey as me. I'm just showing you a simple way of what I had to dig deep and, uh, and understand and find out about myself as I navigate through this world, how I adapted to this world. So in my early age, I went to a high school in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and I barely graduated. I got, uh, I was at the bottom three. I didn't get a chance to walk on stage. Um, for many years, that kind of haunted me. That kind of plagued me, where I felt like I always had to overcome that, that circumstance, that situation. So I carried that attitude when I joined the Air Force. When I joined the Air Force, I focused on myself. How can I project an image of being better? How can I stand out among my peers and just no longer look at as the person that failed, right? So I went on that path, I went on that journey. I was doing great, I actually did really well. But then I hit a wall where I'm like, this, is, this can't be it, this can't be it. I work, I work hard. I try to impress my supervisors, my leadership, my lieutenant. I, um, yeah, my higher ups. I try to, you, gotta, you try to try to impress them. I am impressing them, but I'm still not tapping into that joy. So I ran its course. Air Force, I got burnt out. I got tired. Um, so I decided to leave. So before I left, my major was speaking to me. And my major told me, hey, if you leave, uh, you might be uh, having to take a job of pumping gas. And I was like, okay, <laughs> all right. For one, like it's a bad thing. Hey, it's a job, it's, a, it's an honest job. So what's so bad about it? But it's almost to say that I couldn't survive without the military. So he wanted me to take on the identity of an Air Force member, of an airman. It's like, no, it's two separate things. I am James, and the Air Force is something that I do. That's something I'm a part of. And so rather than focusing on becoming what the Air Force wanted me to become, I had to look at 
okay, I still have to navigate through this. What's my baseline? And I discovered my baseline was love. So I've been doing trainings for the last few months. And one of our activities is talk, talks about love. And so I asked the group of people, some brilliant people, smart people, supervisors, managers, and I asked them, what is love? And you hear crickets. <laughs> what is love? Who knows what love is? And so it's kind of unfair because in English, the word love can mean a million other things, different things. It could mean, I love my dog, I love my cat, I love my wife, I love my car, right? But that's not the love necessarily I'm talking about. So we're kind of limited when we remain in the, in the English. So if you go to the Greek, there's many layers of love, right? There's agape love, there's phileo love, there's eros love, there's um, phile um, what is that? storge love, right? There's parental love, there is uh, a, a romantic love, there is a unconditional love, which is agape, right? So if I started to not focus on myself, but decided to actually show people agape, to show them love without strings, I was able to navigate a lot easier. And let's talk about expectations and those strings. So what about my peers, right? So Air Force, I was focusing on myself. It didn't work out too well. I joined the Department of Corrections. So I did that for about five years and I actually moved up pretty quick. After three years, I became a sergeant. And with that, it, um, I was one of the young guys. I was a young sergeant. And so it was a similar thing where I thought, hey, I have to prove myself. Remember, I'm the guy who barely graduated high school. So let me try this, let me try this again. It didn't work out in the Air Force, but let me look at this organization, let me try again. But this time I gave myself more to the organization. So giving myself to organization, how'd that look? I remember one time I was on vacation and I got a call in the middle of my vacation. And they said, hey, James, we're short on staff. Can you come in? I'm on vacation. So I got to look at my wife and say, hey, the organization needs me. I'm part of the organization. So let me go. So when time came, I thought those are one of the cards I could hold in my deck that was time to promote that I could use. And did it work? No, it didn't work. Everyone um, who's on my panel, everyone who's on my panel, uh, they passed on me. So at that time, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to be an overachiever. And I scored in the high 90s uh, for my Sargis test. And, it started, and, and um, getting that high score, I was in the top three, right? I'm from the bottom three in high school, top three to get promoted to sergeant. And so again, like I said, I gave myself to the organization. Did the organization uh, promote me? And this is not a, 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 a slight against Colorado Department of Corrections. I'm, I, I love them. They're great. But when I went for promotion, they hired eight people past me, right? So again, hey, but I, if I try hard, if I give myself to the organization, they will recognize me, right? No. No, no. So... What approach did I have to take? Okay, I have to remove expectation. So if I'm deciding to work hard, if I'm deciding to be part of an organization, I'm removing that expectation. Just because I work hard doesn't necessarily, is gonna say that everyone accept, accepts me. It's not gonna necessarily say that if I work hard that um, I'm gonna get that promotion. That's not true. So when you allow people to operate and to live and to work without expectations, you're communicating a lot more. You're not assuming that people know things, right? So sometimes if, if we're working with someone, we can say, oh, we, oh, if this is the culture of the, wherever we're at and people should just follow along and you're gonna expect that as time goes on. But if you never told them, how would you expect them to get that? Just through osmosis, just being around? Or did you communicate that out? And when you do that, when you remove expectations about how, what people should be doing or shouldn't be doing, and you're actually communicating it, when they do act outside of what the organization is trying to do, you can discuss it. You're like, hey, we talked about this, versus jumping on them on the first time for not knowing or not getting it. So there's a lot of freedom when you remove expectation. When someone acts in a certain way that you necessarily wouldn't, that's totally fine. And so if you see on the bottom of the slide there, you're gonna see a 
broken glass of water. Now, with that water, some, somebody, somebody might look at it and say, hey, someone wants, needs to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Someone might say that. Someone might look at that glass and say, why are we even talking about it? Just clean it up. Someone else might say, hey, how, what can we do to make sure that this doesn't happen in the future? And all those things are valid. All those things are okay. But what can happen sometimes with conflict within a work environment is that we're expecting that every, everyone's going to see the problem and see the answers like I do. And that's not necessarily the case. So if we remove expectation, we communicate what we're looking for, what we're trying to do, you're going to free a lot of people up and you're going to free yourself up in trying to control what they do and what they think and how they feel. So what about my boss? And I asked you earlier, I asked you earlier, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm a mover. I'm a mover and a shaker. I'm sorry. I'm a mover and a shaker. So what about my boss? So this is what I did. It's an internal study, not officially approved by anyone. But what I did was I would talk to people as they uh, decided to leave the library. So I asked a group of people um, who, let's say, for instance, had three years in. I would ask them, three years or less, I would ask them, why are you leaving? And you know what they would say? My boss, my supervisor. And they would go on and on and on and on. And I'll take it all in. I'll take it all in. But then I would talk to people who've been in the organization for 15 plus years. And I say, hey, why are you still here? And you know what they would say? Not a single word about their supervisor. They'll talk about the awesome programmings, all the growth opportunities, all the, all the people that helped them when they were weak, that people came alongside them to help them to gain a skill or to, to promote or to grow. So the definition of leadership, it could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And that's why, like I said, I asked earlier, if we took that list and we tallied everything up, um, the priority that you might have is different than someone else. So if we gather all together, all the answers, and we uh, uh, impose that onto an actual person, there's no person who actually exists that way, right? So let's funnel it down. Leadership within and leadership without. What does that mean? So leadership without is a person that is a leader um, regardless of what position they're in. It doesn't matter what, where you put them. It doesn't matter if you put them on, uh, on an island, alone on an island, they're gonna lead something. Some animals or something, they're gonna, they're gonna just lead. That's just who they are, right? But sometimes there's leadership without. Now, what does that mean, leadership without? There are some people who are placed in positions. They might have the education. They might have the networking skills to just move on into a, a particular position. Now, those people are hard to work with. They were hard to work for, right? A person in any other case, you would never follow them, but you have to because you work for them. So again, how can we get out of the rut of focusing so much on the leader? What can we do? How about we write down everything that we have, the qualities that we have. Write those things down. Write all the things that you have. All the things, all the things that you bring, right? Just write that out. And then look at your supervisor, write down all the things that, that they have as far as quality. Everyone has some kind of gift. If there's only one thing, that's great. And then what I want you to do is make another list and look where there's gaps in your, in your skill set, in your knowledge base. Can you use this one person to gain those skills? So, like the word boss, let me throw this out there real quick. I only got a few more minutes left. So the word boss, what does it mean? Where does it come from? I don't know, where did boss come from? So boss is actually a word that was developed after um, the Civil War. The word boss is actually a word uh, based in Dutch, which means master, okay? So after the Civil War, white people no longer wanted to call another white person master. No, that's relegated to slaves, right? A black person who was now, now free didn't want to call a white person master. So just like how we do in America, we just take what we want and change it up. So rather than saying a master, you can say boss, which even though it means master. So now think about this. My supervisor, my boss is Taylor. 
So if I go home tonight and talk to my wife and say, man, my boss, she's such a, she gets on my nerves. She knows what I'm talking about, right? If I say, Taylor, man, she's just, oh man, she's getting on my nerves, which is not true, Taylor, if you're watching, <laughs> right? So she would know what I'm talking about. Now think about this. If I went home and said, Master Taylor is getting on my nerves. I'm not getting paid to think about this. I'm not paid to think about her, but I'm so focused on her. So what I'm asking you to do is quit focusing on the person and focus on the attributes that they have. There's things, regardless of what this person is, they are leadership, if they're a leader within or without, there's something you can learn from. So if you focus on that, you're not gonna be so frustrated. And this helps you to understand who you are, help to build who you are uh, within yourself and to build your true identity. So let me, what if you're the boss? I'm gonna say this real quick so I don't have too much time. Um, don't ask somebody to do something that you, you're not willing to do. <laughs> so, so when someone knows that, hey, there's a task, are you relegating them to a task that you wouldn't do? Um, that's hard to just listen to someone who, who does that. But if a person is willing to do that, especially now, look at um, if you, as a boss, ever said, hey, I would never mop. I would never clean up, a, uh, clean up after anything. If you have that in your mindset, I think in the current times that we're in, Please help clean up. Please help everyone. So just real quick. So Lauren asked me to make sure to talk about uh, something creative. So you have a advantage in creating your true identity, right? And so STEM was the big thing, but esteem now, right? Why is that art piece? Being a creative, being a person who creates things, you're constantly putting things out there to be critiqued. You're constantly putting these uh, things out to the world for the world to see. And people are going to critique those things. And so the more you allow that to happen, the freer you are with taking risk. And so that's where creatives are um, more, can be more resilient than a person who's adverse to risk, who just stays in their box and not take risk. So you yourself can take risk not only with your art, but who you are and advocating for yourself, talking about the things that you will do and won't do. And when you do that and you find out, you, you, you take it all away, you understand at the bedrock who you really are. And so let's say for instance, someone's asked you to do some consultation work, asked you to create a website. If you're not comfortable with it, you can get to that answer quicker. Like, no, I'm not doing that. That's not who I am. That's not my brand. That's not, um, that's not part of, of what I'm trying to do. You get there quicker because you know what you're about and you know what your company is about. So creatives do have an advantage if they allow that criticism. If you allow someone like Uncle Chan to say, hey, what, you know what? Sometimes you lie and you can learn from that. So I'm gonna finish with this, self-esteem versus uh, self-evaluation. So self-esteem, you can read plenty of books on self-esteem. Now, what's, we were talking about words, like talking about boss. Esteem, what is this esteem word? What does that mean? So if you look at esteem, the real word, if you look at the Latin, it means judge. So when you're all about self-esteem, you're self-judging yourself. And it's kind of really unfair because you're judging yourself to the best version of yourself. Not the person who, who's sick, not the person who is tired, not the person who's overworked. You're constantly judging yourself about the per from the perspective of a person that's perfect. And so there's a difference. Self-esteem, self-evaluation. Self-evaluation, if you're looking at your, yourself, you say, I need to take four steps forward, right? That's it, self-evaluation, I just need to move four steps. Well, self-esteem does, it does the evaluating part too, but then it judges you and says, well, if you took four steps earlier, you would have been there further, but well, why didn't you start yesterday? And so just, that's all I can say with that, um, keep, and we'll talk more uh, in some way. <laughs> So let me throw this out here. Um, in regards to self-esteem, um, if we try to get from other people, if we try to get people to validate us, what happens is, is that if we don't get it, there's two things that might happen. Like myself, like I talked about earlier, when I try to go for the promotion because I work hard and they didn't give it to me, right? So I have to get it in some way. Either I'm gonna dip down to manipulation, or I'm gonna dip down to uh, resentment. 
right? If you don't give me what I need, this is what I need for my self-esteem if I don't get it, right? Or my self-value. Or again, it's that whole piece of, like I said, with self-esteem, approval from self. I need to value me. I need to do things to value me. And I can show you real quickly that your value as a person has nothing to do with what you create or what you do. You have value because you have value. You have value yesterday, you have value today, you have value tomorrow. With everything going on in this world right now, your value is not based on um, how fast you are, right? It's not based on how strong you are because you might find yourself in a situation where you're not strong tomorrow. And is that okay? Yeah. Yes. And so this is kind of a hard um, way to look at it, but I have to be honest. So working with the public, working within uh, the scope of um, the United States, there's an epidemic right now. And there's a lot of people who are overdosing. And so with that, if a person does overdose, if they're in, in near the library or at the library or anything, what do we use? Use Narcan to get them out of it. Well, why? They made a choice to do what they wanted to do. What value do they have to us? Them just simply, simply existing means that they have value. So today, if you feel like your value is based on performance or doing something, I would have to push back on that and say, everything you're doing, everything you're creating is free. It's just amazing. It's great. But the baseline is your value. And being valued and understanding your value, you can take a lot more risk versus if I make this mistake, then that might hit my self-esteem, therefore I'm not worthy. You don't have to look at it that way. So I end with this, choosing your fuel. What is transferable? What do I mean by that? Focusing on my boss. If I like her, I don't like her. Is that transferable to my next job? No. My benefits that I have. Um, is it transferable? Maybe 401k, maybe, but maybe my benefits uh, my, my leave, my vacation time, it might not transfer, right? Might not transfer. So let me not so, so much focus on the benefits. Or you focus on the supervisor. Focusing on one person, just real quick, focusing on one person, you could turn them to dust at any time. You spend enough time with me, you're gonna be able to rip me apart uh, left and right. So let's not look at uh, choosing that as a fuel. Like how can, what am I not getting? What am I getting from my supervisor? Let's not focus on that. But if you choose, that I want to grow as a person, I want to grow as an individual, I want to have hard conversations. Think about this, if you're, a, if you're a subordinate and you're working for someone, if you're advocating for yourself, if you're learning that, hey, when something's not right, I can speak up to my supervisor, when you're a supervisor, you're gonna be able to more easily speak up for your, your subordinates versus trying to generate that skill uh, at the moment. So choosing your fuel is vitally important. And again, as a creative, as a person who thinks outside of the box, you have that opportunity. Yesterday I, I uh, rode Lyft for the first time and I spoke to, to the driver. He's been a web developer for nine years and he's talking about how, you know, he's just learning who he is, right? He's just figuring out like, oh, the full stack, the back end, the, the, uh, the directories, like he's, he's like, I finally, after nine years, understand who I am. And so that is an amazing story. That's uh, amazing where he left his last job to start on a new journey. But I hope, I hope, and I didn't get a chance to talk to him, it was a short ride, that I hope that he also went on the journey of understanding his identity along with that. So that's all I have, everyone. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> we're clapping for him, we're clapping for him.